Um, farmers who wish to abstract water must contact the Environment Agency at the earliest possible opportunity if they wish to start abstracting more than that 20 cubic metres day, a day figure, um, or if they want to make changes to their existing licence um, that authorises uh, irrigation. Now, quite interestingly, there are some um, exemptions at the moment to the abstraction rules, particularly associated with trickle irrigation. Um, and th the general thinking is that at some point in the very near future, those will be bought within the scope of the ab abstraction licensing process. And it's quite important that farmers keep up to date with the EA websites as that changes to make sure whether they need to get a license or not. That's a little warning that really needs to be um, made clear to farmers just to, to make sure that from time to time they visit the EA website and make sure that they are keeping up to date uh, with what they're required to do. Um, just a quick reminder on record keeping associated with NVZs. There's no changes to the NVZ uh, rules this current year, but some of the key dates associated with the requirements to keep specific records, do some of the calculations related to total manures uh, produced on the farm, the storage uh, requirements associated with um, the manures on the farm are relevant this year, both for the existing NVZ uh, areas and for the newly designated areas. I'm not going to run through them uh, one by one, they're on the slide and you'll be able to pick them up from the, uh, from the website afterwards but they're just something that perhaps I think needs flagging up to farmers and making sure that they have got all their paperwork in order as and when uh, an inspector calls. Um, key date really is the, so the 30th of April. Um, so this week uh, there are some quite significant bits and pieces of record keeping that farmers and calculations that farmers should have in place by the end of w this week if they're to, um, if they're to uh, uh, successfully pass an inspection. Um, minor change associated with cattle identification and, and registration. Cattle identification really has been the big problem area in terms of non-compliance. All sorts of non-compliances associated with cattle identification, particularly associated with things like deaths on farms that don't get recorded, linked holdings that don't get properly renewed. Um, it is consistently the area where the vast majority of cross-compliance failures take place. There has been a change this year associated with um, sending passports back associated with cattle that have died in the holding. In the past, animals over 24 months of age, the passport has gone uh, with the animal. Now they all go direct back to the BCMS as and when uh, the animal uh, dies. So a change there that's been effective since um, the 1st of January, actually, 2009. Really, in passing, I just want to flag up the whole issue associated with sheep and goat identification. I'm not going to run through that in detail this morning because we have done many training events in the past specifically aimed at the uh, sheep and goat identification issue, but clearly that's something that came in from the 1st of January this year. Um, I think the guidebook associated with that is a very thorough guide in terms of, uh, in terms of weaving uh, the way through those regulations, and there are one or two very, very good flow diagrams associated with that guidebook, which I think are are just sort of worth keeping by you as and when you're talking to, to farmers in terms of how to identify different animals at different times and the recording requirements associated with movements and the holding register um, at different times for different groups of livestock. So to come on to some of the minor changes that have been made to uh, cross-compliance uh, in the current year, there have been minor changes to SMR10, which are the restrictions associated with uh, hormonal substances uh, that has really been an issue that barely applies to the UK, so I don't intend to go into that in detail. I think that's a technical issue. There has been a change to SMR 11, the food and feed law, in that food and feed businesses have to produce their, um, have to ensure their produce does not contain traces of pesticides and veterinary uh, medicines that exceed, exceed the, the minimum le uh, residue levels. Um, I don't think farmers are expected to start testing stuff to ensure that. The general view is that if pesticides and veterinary medicines are used as required, uh, they will not exceed the, minimum residue, the maximum residue le levels. But there is an issue there that, that, that farmers need to be aware of. Also under SMR 11, um, there's a requirement that's new this year that farmers must take account of the results of any uh, analysis that they have had done 
on samples taken, either from livestock or from crops. Historically, they've had to retain those records, but there hasn't been a specific requirement to take account of them. As of 2010, there is a requirement to take account, so they need to take notice of them and, and if necessary, change their management pra practices accordingly. Uh, and then there has also been a, 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 a really a technical change to the, um, uh, the notification of, um, the con uh, notification of uh, disease where African swine fever has been removed from the list, but I don't think that's hugely relevant, really, to, to the UK situation. There's also been quite an important change associated with um, the liabilities associated with cross-compliance um, failures, particularly where land changes hands during the course of the year. Um, historically, the claimant was responsible for cross-compliance across the whole of the calendar year, and there's now been a change for 2010 that creates an exception to that rule. And if the transferee or the transferor also claim, then they will be responsible for cross-compliance for the period in which the um, land is at their disposal. I suspect the key issue there for many farmers is to make sure that they have adequate paperwork, tenancy agreements or whatever in place to clearly identify who, when the land was at whose disposal. Um, but that's really quite a major change and I think will be a comfort to an awful lot of farmers where they see land coming uh, in and out of their farming businesses associated with FBTs and, 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 and issues such as that. There's also been a change to um, the intentional non-compliance rules. Um, the capping rule, which already applies to multiple failures um, in relation to negligence non-compliance now relate to intentional non-compliance. So where there were perhaps uh, several failures associated with, let's say, NVZs, um, as negligent failures, they would count as one failure. That also now applies if they're intentional failures. Um, intentional failures are quite few and far between, so again, I suspect that change is more administrative than real in many circumstances. But again, it's something else that you need to be aware of. And then finally, there has been a, a change that introduces the concept of for, force majeure and exceptional circumstances into cross-compliance. And force majeure is fairly, fairly um, serious issues. It's issues along the lines of um, there was a death in the family or something like that. Force majeure isn't I was busy lambing my sheep and that's why I didn't manage to keep up to date with my record keeping. But where there are major uh, changes within a business, a farmer might be able to use force majeure as a reason why he hasn't managed to keep up to date with um, keep up to date with uh, uh, his cross compliance requirement. Um, thank you very much. That concludes the sort of first part of the program and the general up um, update associated with cross compliance.